The story of the Grassfields people of West Cameroon starts in the Sudan in the 8th century, when the Ngara ancestors of the Mboum left the Happy River Valley and migrated into Central Africa. Their journey follows after a long tradition of Remen Kimi traveling to the Lake Chad area, as is exemplified by the Mentu Atep II inscription at Jebel Awena, as well as the documentation of flora, fauna, cultural themes, and Paleo-African linguistics in the rendering of awareness in the Amdua. Among these Ngara migrants, four brothers were guided by sacred powers from Fav Ben, which led them through the Lake Chad area and eventually to the Adamawa Plateau. The first two powers, called Labi and Sio, descended from the sky and were given to the eldest brothers, Balakumberi and Balakumbusa, respectively. A third power of disappearance, called Mav Ben, was given to Balakamana. The fourth power, called Fam Boom, the parcel of God, was given to Balaka Nyasana and made him the commander of the group. Nyasana then led his brothers to the foot of the Ganha mountain range, where they founded Mboum. Balaka Nyasana, the founder of Mboum, began the succession of rulers that still reign over the Mboum today. Sometime during the 13th century, a princess named Wu-Ten and a group of other Mboum nobility decided to leave Ganha and settle in Danki, now called Rifa, after a succession dispute. Here they met local inhabitants called the Ntumu and engendered the Tikar at the turn of the 14th century. The Tikar are named after the term Tinkalaje, which in the Mboum language means go out, or those who wander. Around the same time, a Remen Kimi man named the Seji left the Happy River Valley and settled in the Lake Chad area where he married a local woman named Nabiju. They had three children named Nsien, Metapen, and Mbupuet. Nsien and Mbupuet would eventually migrate to the Adamawa area and marry Mboom royals who were connected to Wu Ten's succession dispute. Mbupuet would have three sons from this union named Mbuen, Nyimbu, and Kai. Later on, the eldest of the three sons, accompanied by his two brothers, leaves and settles in Paparian, where he founded a family with a local woman. From this union, Nyimbun produced a daughter named Yen, who would later marry the twelfth ruler of the Tikar lineage named Mveta, also called Mvoiva. Among the Tikar, as the years passed, another succession dispute commenced once Mvetam's son, Dika, from royal wife Petalam, was appointed as the next Mvun over one of his five children with Princess Yen. Disgruntled, Yen and her children, Mbe, Nguonso, Mvobam, and Chare, decided to leave Bankin and establish their own Vandams. Mbe became the ruler of Ngambe Ndita among the Tikar. Nguonso became the founder of the Nso. Mvobam became the founder of Bafia Bankara, and Chare became the founder of Bamun in 1394. Though many Mvun reigned over the Bamun, their history is primarily defined by the reign of four Mvun who are Nchare, Mbwombu, Nguhu, and Njoya. Nchare was a short-statured, very jolly and courageous man who was known for his intelligence and brilliant military mind. His successful conquest of Mvomben, which the modern city of Fumban is named after, marked a unique transition for the local region from a subsistence economy to one with a considerable defense industry. Iron-tipped arrows, spears, and lance armaments gave Nchare and the Tikar a significant military advantage which would prove extremely useful in formulating resistance to slave raids during the Ma'afa. This emphasis on defensive capabilities continued until the reign of Bwombo, the 10th Mvrat. Bwombo was extremely tall with red eyes, broad nostrils, and large ears. He was very courageous and generous. He kept the Bamun perpetually under military preparedness and all industries, including agriculture, were subordinate to the defense industry. Every able-bodied man in the Mvundum had to be armed as a defensive measure against slave raiders. According to Bwombo, nation building is the universal preoccupation of strong rulers who become distinguished by the nature and quality of the arms at their disposal. Practically every village had at least one forge for manufacturing various kinds of iron weapons for fighting. Ownership of forges became the hallmark of wealth and true nobility. Under Mwombo, the combination of commercial development and military confrontation led to the quadrupling of Bamun territory extending to the boundaries of the Noon, Mape, Nja, and Reaper rivers. Wombo also implemented geotechnically engineered fortresses in the design of continuous 5 meter ditches reinforced by earthen walls around the Mvundum to slow the advance of foreign raiders. The next important Mvun was Nguhu, who ruled from 1818 to 1863. 
He was a Bamila K servant and rose to the title of Mvun in a vacuum of political instability. Guhu was noted for halting all military expeditions and turned the economy towards domestic affairs. Guhu's 40-year reign refutes the false comparison between chattel slavery in the Western world and indentured servitude regimes in Africa. No slave in America ever became the president, as was the case in numerous African societies where servants were enfranchised. The 17th Mvun in this line and the direct descendant of Nchare is Ibrahim Mwombo Njoya. Njoya came to power in a tumultuous time. His father, Mvun Sangu, had recently been assassinated in a war with the Nso, and his mother, Japdunke, served as a regent until he was prepared for the position of Mvun. During his early days as a ruler, he had encountered many neighboring African peoples and witnessed the effects of colonization and illegal human trafficking in Africa. Understanding this existential threat, at the turn of the 20th century, he embarked on a mission to modernize the Larewa system into a syllabary to preserve the history of the Bamum. The Bamum, like all African people, used a variety of symbols to define their reality. During the first stage of the evolution of the writing system, around 1895, Joya transformed the glyphs from a system with about 700 signs to 510 signs, with 10 arithmetic digits and punctuation. This stage was called Larewa. Like Ndudenter of ancient Kimi, Larewa is a logographic system, of which 80% is composed of pictograms representing everyday objects in nature, plants, and parts of the human body and the other 20% composed of ideograms and phonograms, representing abstract ideas and sounds, respectively. Most words feature a combination of these signs. This early form of writing was written multi-directional, from left to right, right to left, top to bottom, and bottom to top, on clay and wooden tabs, as well as animal skins using charcoal. Njoya set up or Order of the King Scholars, in order to comprehensively enhance the usage of the script. The next phase of writing developed between 1899 and 1901. It was called Mbima, which means mixture in Shupim, the language of Bamun. It included 439 characters, 10 arithmetic digits, and one punctuation sign. Here, Enjoya eliminated 116 signs that he wasn't satisfied with and introduced 45 characters to overcome phonetic shortcomings. Like Larewa, Mbima is a logographic system where pictograms dominate over ideograms. In the beginning of 1902, the third iteration of the Bamun script, Yinyi Fafu, which means God has given grace, was created. Yinyi Fafu is reduced by 56 characters, down to 381, including 10 arithmetic digits and two punctuation marks. Here, ideograms are made primary over pictograms, and left to right writing was mandated, resulting in an expansion of literary activity, numerous correspondences, and property transactions. In 1903, Njoya built schools to teach the writing and also began translating scriptural texts. The fourth phase of the Bamun script came in 1907 with Rini Fafu. This script had only 286 characters, 10 numbers, and two punctuations with the logograms simplified. The fifth iteration of the script, Rini Fufen, began a year after the development of the previous stage and represents the last logographic step of the alphabet. It contains 81 characters less with 205 symbols. This stage totally eliminated pictograms in favor of ideograms and syllables. In February of 1910, Joya completed the process of going from a pictosyllabic system to the syllabographemic system in the development of Akauku. Akauku has 83 characters. 70 graphemes, 10 arithmetic digits, and 3 diacritics. Akauku Mbembe has 91 characters, 70 syllabographemic characters, 10 arithmetic digits, 3 diacritics, 3 punctuation signs, and 5 arithmetic signs. In about 15 years and 5 successive stages, the end result of this transformation was Akauku Mbembe, and this allowed the Bamun to produce maps, birth certificates, construction blueprints, administration documents, court acts, accountings, and historical archives. As a historian, Joya wrote a book about the history of the Bamun called Sangam, also called Libanor Oska, or the history and customs of the Bamun. Along with other texts in the Bamun archives, documenting the Hyper River Valley origins of the Bamun. This documentary evidence is important because it helps solidify classical African history 
against the charges of hyperdiffusionism and hermeticism leveled against Africana studies. First off, Joya's testimony occurred prior to any direct contact by Eurasians and is rooted in the pre Larewa pictograms that, according to Dr. Shekhan Tidjok and Theophilo Benga, descend from Paleo African graphical systems related to Mdudute. The impetus behind the modernization of the Larewa system to compiling Bamun history was for cultural preservation and to protect the Bamun from contamination of external narratives such as those from the Western Judeo Christian world. In this matter, Bamun syncretism maintains local autonomy while engaging with Abrahamic traditions theologically. The ancestral lineage of the Bamun does not contain any major Abrahamic characters and lists Africans from the continent whose relationship to West Asia is strictly commercial. These facts completely contrast the central components of the Hermetic hypothesis and valorize Njoya's commitment to a pan-African revolutionary renaissance. In 1916, Njoya exercised his theological expertise in the founding of a syncretic salvation-based faith rooted in solar epistemology called Nuetque. Nuetque builds upon Bamun ontology and cosmogonic vision, dividing the world between the sacred and profane zones, as well as the visible and the invisible. The zone of the sacred and the invisible is that of the divine and the ancestors. For the Bamun, yin yi is the realm of existence. According to Enjoya, all human races pray to God in the language of their country, and not in the language of ancient times. God hears because it is he who created all men. He gave them this language. All those to whom God has given a mouth speak, and God understands them because God has given them this language. As a medical researcher, Joya established a large variety of texts on pharmacopoeia and traditional healing, called Libonar Compen, also Le Reba Yuret. As a metaphysician, he wrote a book about the interpretation of dreams. As a sociologist, he wrote a book about matrimony and how to make a marriage last, called Le Reba Nu Nguet, also called Libonar Tarotam Fran, or The Book of Love. As a geographer and cartographer, he made a map of the territory called Lewa Ngu with special consideration on the capital city of Fumba. As an academician, he chaired a scientific committee that wrote a Schumann dictionary. By 1914, there were a total of 40 Akauku schools that had spread to both Tikar and Bamalike country for the learning of the writing. Its schools were sanctioned by diplomas, all signed by Njoya. The various sections of his schools were a medicine department headed by Queen Fu Asana, a casting and carving section headed by Monliper Jimonjab, a calligraphy section headed by Yermia Jean, a weaving and embroidery section, a basketry section, and a coiffure section headed by Njachembe. Njoya also went through a series of reforms in the Mvandam of Bamun. He was a champion of human rights far ahead of his time and demonstrated the integrity of pre-colonial African political systems when it comes to egalitarianism. Njoya did not exercise autocratic rule over the Bamun. He had a large amount of official counselors and elders who assisted him. These political dynamics allowed him to engage in a variety of reforms that echo those of his distant ancestor, Amenhotep III, in the 18th dynasty of ancient Kimi. Some of them were matrimonial law reforms relating to dowry reimbursements in the case of marital abuses, the extension of mortuary and funerary rite burials to non-nobles, inhabitants outside of Fumban, and servants who had not finished paying off their debts, reformed widowhood rights protecting the sanctity of women who had recently lost their husband, reformed laws regarding the mode of dress and ornaments, which allowed women to wear pearl earrings, copper rings, umbrellas, shoelaces, and headdresses decorated with the image of a chameleon, and other items that were previously prohibited, the protection of the environment and biodiversity, banning the cutting down of banana trees or greenery on the property of the deceased. The reformation of royal chore mandates, prohibiting the guarding of the royal palace by servants for consecutive days. The removal of certain consumption prohibitions, allowing commoners to smoke from a metal pipe and eat from metal dishes. The expansion of commercial access, allowing commoners to sell raffia palms, worms, cola nuts, honey, multicolored bags, crude oil, yam, large bananas, and metal tools. Politically speaking, Joya also abolished the death penalty for adultery with a princess, sleeping with a prostitute, forced abortion, and engaging in spider divination outside of official supervision. Capital punishment without a trial was also banned for trespasses against the Mvut, and numerous petty offenses against royals were decriminalized. After these reforms, the Bamum had more access to the Mvun than ever before. 
This was even the case in the event of assassination attempts and coups. Vetcom, who sought to overthrow Njoya, was allowed to stand trial for treason before ultimately receiving capital punishment. On the technology side, Njoya demonstrated many different areas of expertise, such as chemical engineering and his introduction of a pharmacopoeia, as well as the development of ink from caramelized corn, geospatial engineering in the enhancement of bamboo cartography, mechanical engineering in the introduction of a grinding mill, thermodynamics in his introduction of a blast furnace, material science in his introduction of a textile mill for embroidery, environmental engineering in his amplification of bamboo agriculture and the raising of an ostrich farm, transportation engineering in the usage of LA palm kernel nuts to pave roadways in order to influence people to leave the lowlands and move to the developed highlands around Fumban, geotechnical engineering in his usage of lemongrass to prevent settlement erosion beneath the new Fumban palace, as well as architectural and structural engineering in the modernization of Bamun building systems, as is exemplified in the reconstruction of the Fumban Palace after it was burned down in 1913. The architectural systems of the Bamun feature many prominent elements of African architecture in their vaulted roofs with ventilation, framed opening moldings, projecting sills, adobe bricks, bioenvironmental mimicry, and fractal proxemics. Joya was exposed to a variety of architectural and building traditions during his childhood and early years of reign from his own travels, encounters with external merchants, as well as his reading of Ajami text. He encountered Hausa traditional homes, the Muskum Teliu in northern Cameroon, as well as the Sola Somolo and Batamaliba Tata Somba building systems of northern Togo and Burkina Faso. A combination of these unique structural forms contributed to the development of the new Fumban Palace. Many of the German ethnographers were quite impressed with the new palace and thought Njoya must have copied the building style of Europeans. The problem with this assumption is that prominent indigenous elements are identified in the new structure, such as encircling verandas, deep eaves, carved wood posts, raffia palm formwork, and laterite clay bricks. According to Mari Thorbeck, the way in which the brown wood walls of the upper floor rise out of the white plaster of the stone wall below attests to a natural instinct that the Negro could never learn from whites, an instinct that lies in his blood through the inheritance of generations. Mouvant and Joya affirmed that the design of the Fumban Palace had been the result of his own ingenuity and structural engineering expertise. According to Njoya, long ago King Njoya built behind the palace a more beautiful dwelling than any that existed. It looked like a white house. However, the king had not yet seen any of their houses when he built them. He himself had imagined the way to build it. The terracing was high. It was built with bricks. The ceiling was covered with earth, and on the ceiling another room was built. The roof was of mats. This dwelling was named Nkuyam. The ladder that allowed access to the upper room was so well made that you didn't feel like you were climbing a ladder when you were going to the upper floor. An outside staircase gave access to the first room, and from this one went to the upper floor. The floor on the ground floor was so well done that you would have thought that it was not made of earth. It was in the upper room that the king spent the night. It was beautifully decorated. The walls were covered with fabrics. The floor was covered with mats. The hearth was coated with a kind of varnish. The veranda which surrounded this room was also covered with mats. Two metal pipes connected the first floor and the ground floor. One was for the water and the other for the wine. A long string ran from top to bottom. Every morning, water poured into one of these pipes, and the servants who spent the night on the ground floor came there to take the water necessary for their toilet. When the king wanted to give wine to the servants, he had it poured into the other pipe, and they came to fill their ndu, drinking vessel, without seeing the one doing the service. Joya also demonstrated immense expertise in political science and African agency in spite of colonialism, through his unique role as a marginal seeking, transitioning the Bamun from polemological politics to diplomatic politics. In 1884, after the Berlin Conference, Germany was given Cameroon as a concession. The Germans conducted a treaty with the Sawa in Douala. Though this was the onset of the German political project, the Douala interpreted this treaty as purely a commercial deal. By 1888, Jürgen Zintgraf started an expedition to the grass fields, but did not reach Bamun. 
By the 1890s, the Bamun entered into a strategic alliance with the Fube of Banyo to defeat a coup attempt. The ancestral links between the Lamedo of Banyo constitute a long history of political and economic commercial ties and pleasantry alliances. Jacques Moly documents the alliances of Avaso, Manjaralabi, and Hulari Sanankuya existing in this region of Western Cameroon. Once the Lamedo of Banyo helped enjoy a defeat in Bekam's coup, the Bamun began importing Hausa textiles, built a mosque in Fumban, and embraced a syncretic form of Islam. By 1902, the Germans had stationed in Bamanda, but did not yet control Bamun. Their relationship from this point onward was strictly commercial and did not include German control. By 1906, the Basel Mission Church and School was set up in Fumba with the approval of Njoya. Relations were good. The Bamun remained independent and Joya did not adhere to the administrative protocols of the Germans that prohibited military mobilization and engagement. This is exemplified by Bamun troops performing armed drills in the German administrative capital in Bo in 1908. This occurred when Joya traveled 350 kilometers from his residence in Fumban to meet the local governor. A postcard was printed of this incident. According to Dr. Stephanie Mischel, this image shows that the relationship between the Bamun and the Germans is more complex and does not neatly fit into the simplistic Africa-Europe metropolis-periphery dichotomy. With that stated, it is easy to refute the absurd notion that Njoya was a subordinate to the Germans. To the contrary, according to history and customs, the Germans did good to him, Njoya. They leave him all the power to govern all the country of the Bamun. As long as he governed the country, there was no disorder either among the whites or among the Bamun. As we could see, the maintenance of Bamun political autonomy and independence was a quintessential element of the dealings between Joya and the Germans. On the 1908 postcard, Joya poses with uniforms made with Hausa embroidery and Kauri Snell designs incorporated. He also wore chains of leopard teeth that were typically reserved for the Mvun. Joya wore the white fabric, sabers, boots, and headgears reserved for the elite European officers in the German military. The belt, headgear, and group pose in open nature also serve to indicate Bamun autonomy. Njoya wanted to send a message to the German people and the Kaiser himself that he was entering into a diplomatic relationship as an equal and not a subordinate. He did this by using poses, symbols, and styles that he had come to know in the contact zone and that he had applied to his Bamun regalia. Here, all of the highest symbols reserved by whites were taken over by Africans. This represented an insecurity in the colonial objectives of the Germans. The usage of military uniforms of adversaries by Africans is a common practice. The Herero did this in the war against the Germans as a form of psychological warfare. This is reminiscent of the Odorupa in Namibia and the Benin Goma in Tanzania. In this matter, the usage of European uniforms by Africans cannot solely be understood from the standpoint of reinforcing the German colonial project. Though Germans were at the center of Njoya's diplomatic and political efforts from 1904 to 1909, before and after, he oriented himself towards the Fulbe and Islam. Njoya abandoned the German style abruptly in 1909 due to some disappointing political results of engagement with them. By 1912, the Bamun turned away from the Germans and aligned themselves with the Fulbe. One false repeated claim by those who traffic in imperialist propaganda is a notion that King Njoya betrayed the nationalist revolt of Douala's Rudolf Mangabel in favor of the Germans. German legal scholar Christian Bomerius has refuted this narrative through an analysis of the legal proceedings of Mangabel's trial. Wilhelm Solf and Hermann Röhm concocted a story about Mangabel planning an uprising against the Kaiser to prevent the forced expropriation of Sawa land. Their basis of this claim was speculative chatter between Joya and a former Baum servant named Dame about the recently expired contract between the Sawa and the Germans. Attorney Halpert referred to these renditions as coastal gossip that implicated Mangabel, one of Bell's brothers, and a relative of Mangabel named Akande. The man named Akande was found and testified during the trial stating that he used to live around Mangabel and is not related to him and never worked with a man named Ndame. Mangabel, on the other hand, denied sending any correspondence to Njoya and affirmed that Njoya was not his enemy. 
He denied knowing Dame and also didn't deal with Akande very often. From this evidence, it is clear that allegations of Manga Bell conspiring a revolt and Enjoya rejecting his proposal was political propaganda invented by German imperialists who desired dominion over Sawa land in the wake of World War I. During this specific period, the Bamun practiced positive neutrality in remaining autonomous and not taking the side of any particular foreign nation. Joyous political maneuvering occurred at a time when anti-imperialist sentiment among Africans in the Americas was very high in the period between 1890 and 1910. His smart power dealing with the Germans also adds context to Garvey's meeting with the Invisible Empire and his plan to get Germany to pay their Great War debt by transferring their former colonies to the UNIA. This plan was championed by Senator Joseph France of Maryland and German East Africa Governor Heinrich Schnee, who sat in the long line of politicians in the Western world who advocated for black repatriation as a solution to racial antagonism. When UNIA operative John Smith set up a chapter of the organization in Douala, Cameroon in 1923 under the guidance of Garvey, this established a quintessential piece of an international allegiance among African people against imperialism. Njoya's role as a marginal seeking facilitated this power building project by providing a blueprint to connect Africans throughout the diaspora to their ancestral homeland via technological innovation and civilizational development. His resistance against France set shockwaves in the region and later blossomed into the Congo War of War as well as the UPC Revolution, typified by the Bangun von Paul Bernard Kamayu's usage of Njoya's auxiliary governance model to gather intelligence and galvanize African revolutionaries against European imperialists. Njoya exemplified the ability of African societies to remain dynamic in spite of external pressures and maintain autonomy. His advancements in a multitude of fields, from linguistics to geopolitics, prove that the African universe has the innate capacity to produce and apply distinct scientific methods to the strategic modernization of our political economies. His legacy in African-centered historiography institutionalize the relationship between classical and contemporary Africa and amplify our legitimate memory. In the words of the great Dr. Joseph Kizerbo, Njoya brought the palette of the African spirit to the level of a genius. By acting on Njoya's command and taking hold of our own destiny as African people, we will be able to build a transformative reality and accomplish what we will.